apart from the fact that there are hundreds and hundreds of divine names and, and the list of attributes gets very restricted um, and uh, incomprehensible to most people, um, uh, you can see that uh, attributes to us and to most Western lang European languages, most languages, attributes or their cognates suggest qualities um, someone or something has, like weighing 500 pounds or having red hair, or, you know, it, it, it suggests a quality someone has, but names um, just uh, don't suggest any such thing. A, a, a name may be Peter, a name may be mom, a name be you there, you know, you can, you, names are means by we call upon someone, we summon them, we upbraid them, um, we uh, reproach them. So names are uh, about being in relation and their uh, their naming is a, um, a, a human activity. Naming is a, it profoundly reaches across all our activities. I think it deserves philosophical, probably more philosophical attention than it gets. So um, certain things, if you view them as attributes, eternal, um, it, it, becomes a quality God has. And, and so I think what happens in early modernity is there's a tendency, for better, for worse, to uh, go for proofs to the existence of God um, and, and that generate certain attributes and think that those deliver God. I mean, frankly, John Locke does this. And um, in, in Locke's corner, for Locke's defense, um, he was a, a, um, a devout Christian. He really, coming out of the wars of religion, the idea of having a demonstrable proof that was neutral, that didn't rely on scripture, or didn't mention Jesus at all, was highly desirable. But of course, what you get, Locke is a particularly, I'm afraid to say, a particularly crude example of this because he, he says, well, we, you know, prove a, God exists and we get a number of qualities um, that are qualities we admire in a man and we just sort of magnify them up, bounce them up a lot. Um, and, and then we've got, you know, an account of God. So this is yeah, deism full stream, really. And it's making God a big jumped up man. And of course, in the past 30 or 40 years, um, all kinds of people, including a lot of feminist theologians have leapt on this and say the Christian God is, you know, just the Wizard of Oz, he's this hateful figure. How can you worship a God who's immortal and invisible and eternal? And um, although um, I, I, I would consider myself um, a feminist, uh, I certainly um, couldn't go along with all these criticisms. I do think they, they however, accurately affect a kind of rough deism that's in the air in modernity that probably a lot of Christians as well as anti-Christians just take is Christianity. I mean, a good anti-Christian example of this is Richard Dawkins, who's made a living out of saying the Christian God is this big jumped up guy who beats people with a stick. And, um, you know, so I really felt a need to respond to this and, and to say, well, no, that's not where it comes from. For instance, let me go through with, I've mentioned Augustine already. Um, for Augustine to say God is um, um, omnipresent uh, doesn't mean like a big gaseous thing. It means that at every stage in Augustine's life, God was present, even Augustine says, um, because he only comes to a full Christian um, uh, confession later in life, even when um, um, Augustine did not know that God was there with him, God was there with him because there's no place God is not, no time God is not. God, God's reality as the creator is there in every place and every time. So this is not a, a steely sort of God looking down through a big magnifying glass at us, but rather what it means for God to be creator and present to God's creation. 